Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Luba Guze. I'm the Assistant Director of Capital Planning at the New York City Department of City Planning. I'm Ann Dial. Um, many of you know me as the person who is No, I'm not going to talk about I'm the director of FIT at the Department of City Planning. Thank you all for being here today. Yeah, we're really excited. We're going to talk through the Capital Planning Explorer. I'm going to do an overview of the tool itself. And then Amanda's going to walk you through a deep dive of how they put together the capital projects portion of the data. This is a beta product, so we're really excited to hear about how you might be interested in using this data. We recently released it back in December. So the Capital Planning Explorer is its public data plus maps of capital projects, facilities, and housing data. It's a single platform that basically is home to three data sets and then a bunch of auxiliary data sets. And you'll see as we walk through it that you can really interact with any of these three data sets in the platform itself. It's a tool that we developed at Capital Planning and, and with collaboration from these other divisions as really a, initially conceived of as a resource for planners and now as a resource for the public. It's something where we think these are really base data sets that you should be aware of and understand how to interact with. If you're thinking about how to plan for the current status of New York City and the future of New York City. So this is really about understanding the physical environment and understanding what might be coming up in the near future in terms of the physical environment. The one big caveat here is that it is a beta product. So we wanted to prioritize getting this out, making it public, giving everyone access to the data before we were able to totally get it perfect. So we there's no limitations of how the tool works and the data, et cetera. We're not gonna spend a ton of time talking through that, but it does exist. It's cataloged. And if you, as you're exploring it, have suggestions for improvement, things that aren't working, et cetera, please feel free to let us know. We're really gonna try to take some time and try to develop and improve this tool in the near future. So that's the, the big caveat before jumping in. So I'm gonna just go ahead and do, so this is the landing page. And as you'll see, it presents you basically three options. Do you wanna look at capital projects, facilities, or new housing developments? Again, it presents itself as three different things, but all of these data sets are available once you're in the platform. So let's start looking through facilities first. So you click in and it shows you, do you want to see a map? Do you want to see data? Do you want to have some of these frequently used pre-generated maps, et cetera? But we're just going to go in and see the full suite of facilities information available. And there's a lot there. There's over 32,000 data points. So before we jump into talking about the facilities data specifically, let me just talk you through how the tool overall works. Over here on the left, you can see this is where you can toggle on and off different data sets, different contextual layers. There's a toggle up here. Within here, you can filter and understand the data set you're specifically looking at more in depth. You see a map. There's also a search for an address. And over here on the right, you can toggle between a map and a table view and then download the data. Whenever you're filtering, you can always download a, a um, filtered view of the data that you're looking at. So that's just orienting ourselves in the tool. So you're looking here, and what is facilities? The facilities database part of it. So this is facilities and program sites that are owned, operated, funded, or licensed by a city, state, or federal agency in New York City. And this data comes from over 50 city, state, and federal sources, which Amanda's team puts together and makes sure that they're deduplicated and approved and geoprocessed and makes it into a single cohesive data product. Thank you so much, Amanda. <laughs> so. We can look at this and we can ask a number of questions and try to answer it with this data. We can ask, how are facilities distributed across the city? How do facilities relate to their surrounding contexts, like transportation? Or what facilities are available in a specific geography? So let's talk through all of those in turn. So say you're interested in cultural institutions. So I'm going to select in here and say, I want to understand cultural institutions. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and you can really see that there's a big concentration in Manhattan, right? There's this somewhat inequitable distribution. There's historical reasons for that, lo lots of contextual reasons for why that may be the case. But then we might say, OK, great. So now we understand cultural institutions a little bit. What about libraries? Libraries are distributed pretty evenly across the entire city. And there's also many reasons for that. There's specific planning around libraries and perhaps less historical reasons why they might be so concentrated in Manhattan. So as you're trying to understand where it's the equitable distribution of resources or just what does the lay of the land look like, having these kinds of granular cuts can be really interesting. You can also toggle on and off administrative boundaries. So perhaps you're interested in, well, are they evenly distributed across uh, community districts or something like that? So you can go over here on the left, say we want to look at administrative boundaries and say we're interested specifically in community districts and that's pre-selected. And now you can see that 
well, this is how many libraries might be in your specific community district. So you live in Queen 7, well, it looks like there's a handful of libraries scattered around the district that you live in. And obviously you can do that for all the different data types. So you can also filter for specific services. So here we have libraries, but say you're interested in senior services. So you can go in here and look at the senior services and how they're distributed. And maybe you have other questions like, okay, I think senior services should be accessible by bus because really seniors are using bus, uh, buses as a really important way of transporting themselves to and from important locations. And you can go to the contextual layer for transportation. Subways are pre-selected, but we're interested in bus stops. And we're gonna zoom in and see what's happening. And so you can see the bus stops across the city and you can see how close or far different senior center locations might be from bus routes. So again, this is getting to equity issues and really starting to understand how do facilities interact with the context that they're within. If you're interested in uh, understanding more about a specific location, you can click on it and a, a dashboard pops up below and you get information on who it's operated by and who it's overseen by. So this is operated by Wayside Outreach Development, New York City Department of the Aging, and you get some additional information on the, the specific locations of its, the BIN, BBL, et cetera. So this is the slight contextual view of it. Um, there's also, you can do a filtered view, as I said, and so you can get a specific filtered view and download around that area. So let's take a look. Let's say we're interested in all libraries and all health and human services. And we're specifically interested, say, around here. So we are at, what is the address of where we're? Two West Loop Road. Okay, so this is where we are. And you can say, I really want to know what's within one mile of where we are here. You zoom out, it creates the circle around a specific location you're interested in. And you can go over here and download that data just for that location. So in terms of folks who might be doing developments, might want to see exactly what's around a specific radius, this is a great tool. You can go ahead and download that de data. Um, there are some limitations to this data. There's always the possibility of errors, some things that didn't get deduplicated. And also sometimes folks give us the, the addresses of their administrative offices as opposed to the actual service location. We do our best to catch those kind of errors, but when we get that data in, uh, it's really hard for us to process that if they're the actual sources of that data. But by and large, this is a highly accurate view of what the, the lay of the land is in terms of facilities. Any questions about just the facilities portion of it? So it's done twice a year. Is there anything else that's... Okay. Twice a year. <laughs> yeah. The radius is interesting. Does that... Do you have to buy into plans to incorporate Manhattan? This looks as all over these. One mile across the river is not stated. One mile. Across. Yeah, I think you could do additional filtering if you wanted to, if you wanted to filter for the borough. So you could say, I'm only interested in Manhattan. And then it would select just the borough that you're interested in. But in general, we do, it does just do the circle. Yep. It's a deep link. Okay. Yep. You mentioned like 50 different data sources. It like a, a big project and common, a common challenge uh, to. Well, and I wonder if you develop your own custom way of doing this or if they're possible uh, tools. All the code for all the data products are uh, it's open and available on So that way you're useful, that way the graph you would like to make that very easy. Awesome. Okay, great. Okay, so let's talk about one of the other data sets, which is the capital projects. So as you can see, I'm just toggling on and off here on the left. Capital projects look quite different as a data set. You see there's points, there's also big polygons. Sometimes there's a lot of projects happening in a single area. So this is um, showing us something quite specific. This is data from the most recent capital commitment plan. That's a budget document that basically says these are the specific types of capital projects, like individual capital projects that we currently know that we think we're gonna fund in the next decade. So we could, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Uh, but there's 12, over 12,000 funded capital projects. But you can see here, we're only mapping a little over 5,000 of them. That's because some projects aren't mappable. Amanda's going to walk you through how she puts that together in great detail and talk about why that's the case. But this is everything that we know and think to be a mappable capital project. On the left here, again, you can do a lot of filtering. One of the most common ways that we think about capital projects is by their managing agency. So this is the agency that's overseeing the construction of that work. And so you can click in here and look to see what specific agency you might be interested in in case you want to do that filtering or specific plan commitments amounts. 
As always, you can also click in and see the different type of work happening somewhere. So for instance, I live close to Prospect Park. I might be interested in what's the variety of capital projects happening here. And you can see there's paths and resurfacings, et cetera. So you can see the wealth of different projects happening in a single location. Okay. So what do we use this for? We use this to answer questions like, how are city investments distributed across the city? What specific investments are happening in your neighborhood? Maybe you really want to know, is there going to be a bunch of road construction this year, something like that? Or how do investments interact with their surroundings, such as floodplains? So let's take a look at something like that. So say we want to get an understanding of how does this relate to the floodplains. You can go over here, turn on a contextual layer, and turn on the floodplains. And so now we can see, if, especially if you zoom in, there's a variety of capital projects that are happening here in, in southern Queens that might be in the floodplains. Looks like JFK is in the floodplains. Potentially of, of greater concern there. So this is the kind of thing where, you know, we as a city are always talking about what does it mean to be resilient? How, do, how are we investing our, our funds? And then what are your capital projects costs, right? How, what does funding a resilient project versus a non-resilient project look like? And often there's associated costs with making those projects withstand the additional uh, uncertainties surrounding floodplain issues. So this is, you can layer on these different contextual layers and get an understanding and poke around of how, how capital projects are integrated into the overall landscape. We think that this works out, we as planners at DCP, we use this for community engagement. So we'll go out to communities, especially a new development being built, and we can talk about the surrounding capital projects that are getting built there. Planners also can use this to coordinate. So say there's planners at DOT, or a DEP who want to understand, oh, are we planning projects in similar areas? Maybe they didn't yet know they wanted to do some street repaving somewhere where they're going to be uh, doing the pipes, and they can say, oh, we want to tag onto this project, something like that. There's some future coordination possibility. We, you can layer in these kinds of resiliency. So sometimes uh, planners don't have an overall view of what's happening citywide. They'll know what's happening in their agency, but not across all the different agencies. So this lets them see what the other agencies are doing within context like floodplains. And then for all of you, we really want communities to be able to use this data to advocate for things they think they want in the future, things they think aren't being sufficiently budgeted for in the budget. So really excited that this is, so this is, hasn't been released before December of last year, specifically the facilities had been available since 2017. So we're really excited to get folks using this and community boards using this to give us feedback about the budget. There's more data limitations here than there were for the facilities. The biggest caveat being that this is a budgeting document, right? This isn't a planning, this isn't really a reporting document. And we only really have a good idea about the budget for the next year, maybe four years. And everything further out starts to look a little more prospective. And so this isn't, this is exactly what's gonna happen in the next 10 years. We know exactly what the city is gonna build, right? This is currently the city's view of projects they can cite to concrete locations. So it's just not necessarily a fully comprehensive plan. The other thing is that it's just a forward look. So there's projects, say it's like a $10 million project and 9 million of it's been spent. Here it's gonna look like it's just 1 million, right? We're not doing anything that's entire project size. This is really that forward view, what is remaining to get spent. One more caveat here is that this data does not include schools. If you're interested in schools, you have to go over here and look specifically at schools. You can see projects that are capacity projects, so those are adding seats, and non-capacity projects. So that's usually state of good repair, but not, we don't have any funding associated with that. And there's like some capital plan complexities associated there. If you're interested, come talk to me afterwards. Any questions about the this portion? Going forward, so you have a few projects, like capital projects, and then you can look at your sports conference with that. You can be able to see where they are now. Yeah, not yet. Yeah. So you click on a, a capital project and get some information. Yes, for sure. So you can click on a project and you get information of who it's managed by and how much is committed to it. There's no, again, it's not a project man like tracking piece of data. It's just the budget information. Yes, that there. Orange. Um, the intent of perspective is yeah. so it fast and change. Yeah. So like the string of bands or something. One schedule of people here created this. It's a snapshot view. So that's that kind of information is being tracked by agencies as project management. It's not a kind of tracking that we do in the budget per se. Yes. You mentioned that there are some projects that are untackable. Yes. I'm just curious, like, what kind of projects I'm going to have you hold that for a second because Amanda's going to deep dive into that a little bit more. Okay. 
I'm going to really quickly talk about our last type of data here, and that is housing development. So housing happens everywhere. Let's make sure we're not, okay, great. Housing happens everywhere. <laughs> and this shows you three types of housing. It's nude buildings, alterations, and demolitions. So this is any kind of housing related construction that changes the number of units. So there might be alterations that don't shift the number of units and you wouldn't see that here. If you zoom in, it shows you based on the size of the change. So you can see that there's a lot of circles that are differently sized. And here, again, you can look at it to understand what's happening in your neighborhood or get a sense of the type of work happening at certain locations. Our agency partners can also use this to answer different kinds of questions. So for example, if you're DSNY and you're trying to understand how might garbage routes change, you might be interested in I only want to see like permitted construction for new buildings that are, you know, over 500 people. And so you can see here, right, there's a lot happening at Hudson Yards. There's a lot happening in Long Island City. There's things happening along this Brooklyn corridor. And so it really gives you a sense of these are areas we have to analyze to understand, do we need to change how we're approaching providing services based on where we think upcoming housing growth is going to look like be. And again, you can click in and, and get an understanding of the size and a little more information about the developments most of the time. <laughs> As I said, it's a beta product. Yes. And so here you can see the number of units, the net change, and the, the different steps of the DOB pipeline. That's it for the overview. I'm going to turn it over to Amanda to, oh, one more thing. Um, our housing team, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this, our housing team produces really great um, information sheets around housing change. So if you're interested in looking at housing, you're not quite sure how to navigate overall trends. This is a really great resource. Go to the DCP website and you can find a ton of information about how housing is changing over time. This project will allow someone to see, for example, the offshore gas buildings. There is any way to drag the infrastructure, like water supply, gas supply, drainage, and the No, it's going to tell you the status of the building. So it'll tell you when it's they've applied for a permit. They'll tell you when they get that certificate of occupancy, when it's fully complete, et cetera. It's not going to track that kind of connective and is it that connected to any other agency or somebody else who, like a utility company? Yeah. Put, uh, be doing also the work and the that's to plan the projects. Right. Yeah, so this isn't used for that. So we're not tracking that kind of information as part of this. But as that planning is happening, they are obviously talking to each other. It's just not um, happening through the status app. Yep. <laughs> Are you tracking any along with capital projects? So if you meet with the community boards for that area or at all by the demand application tracker? So we don't track the community engagement, but we're going to use this as part of our outreach to community boards in the next uh, budget cycle for their community board budget request. Yes, one more. Right. So when we get a negative future rent in the kind of budget of only negative? It means that we'd allocated funding for it in the budget and we came in under budget. And so we pulled money out of that budget line and allocated it to something different. So it's not that the net wouldn't have changed. It just, it's a reallocation. So it's showing you like budgeting information of how we thought we were going to spend X and we pulled it. Yeah, I can try, try to do this in less than 20 minutes. We're going to dive into how the capital projects database is built. And bear with me, because from my perspective, you can tend to little, know a little bit about capital budgeting to understand what's in the capital database. So what is the capital database? So it's a new way to explore the New York City capital commitment plan and capital spending. And so you may ask, what is the capital commitment plan? I didn't know what it was until I started working at city planning in 2017. And so it is issued by OMB, actually 2015. It was issued by OMB three times a year. It's on target to be released in September, January, and April. That is the New York City budget cycle. And it presents a capital agency's program and anticipated implementation schedule for the current fiscal year in the next three years. I got this from a wonderful PDF that explains the capital budget. And that was a great resource for me when trying to understand all this. Um, and so then the other thing that I learned in 2015, which you don't now know, what is a capital project? So a capital project involves the construction, reconstruction, acquisition, or installation of a physical public improvement with a value of $35,000 or more and a useful life of at least five years. 
if it is less than $35,000 or has a useful life of less than five years, it is not in the capital commitment plan because it's not a capital project. So you can understand what is this information limited to. It does not include spending on programs. Those aren't capital projects. Your community center, like the funding for those initiatives for health services or senior programs, not in here. If it's a building, will be. Scary. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So the capital commitment plan is published in four volumes of a PDF that you cannot control F through. And it looks like this. <laughs> Tell me. So Chris Wong and I, who was my colleague at the time, we sat next to each other. We were like, what do we do? So we first tried to scrape this and we did. So we had to figure out what are these different elements in budget speak. So we first just said, okay, this is a project. So this example is 115 Christie Street Construction. Okay, a discrete project, you know, it's a thing. And then below it is a future commitment. So this is an individual budget line that's saying there's uh, $1,165 that is gonna be allocated in June, 2024, and it's for design. Individual phases of this project for future money to be allocated. And then we have coming from a specific budget line. So the thing that we you know how to grapple with is that obviously there are many commitments associated with a single project, but also a single project can be funded by multiple budget. You're really creating a relational database here when doing that. So we scraped this. We realized our scraper wasn't perfect, but we said, hey, OMD, like we did it. And they said, okay, we'll just give you the data, please. So now we have this. So Muva showed you the map view of the capital uh, projects database, but there's also the table view. And so now if you are someone who is working in an agency and you wanna know what did I get funded for, you don't have to search the uh, PDF like you used to. Because uh, honestly, that's how they, that's how uh, information was communicated. You can use this tool as well to just search every single project that's in the capital commitment plan. And then we map it. And so what I'm going to dive into, so I, I, you know, thank you for bearing with me on my little one-on-one -on, -one on what the capital commitment plan is. So we're going to talk about the fun stuff of how we got information on a map and what's there. So first we partner with three different agencies. Department of Design and Construction, Economic Development Corporation, and Department of Transportation. Those are like some heavy hitter capital agencies. Department of Design and Construction, they manage a lot of capital projects for various agencies. So for example, if you are DEP, for example, so Department of Environmental Protection, you may be funding a project, so you're sponsoring it, saying, here's my money. But Department of Design and Construction may actually be the agency who's managing it and really helping the coordination to say, this is when we're putting shovels in the ground and we're gonna coordinate with DOT so that we're not paving a road and then digging it up a few months later and putting a sewer in. We've all seen that happen. And so they manage and create spatial data for their capital projects. We're like, please just give it to us. And they do, and we're very grateful for that. But then for things where we don't have spatial data for. So we do fuzzy string matching. So what does that mean? So we use a couple different data sets to try to match names of capital projects to other data sets. So in the case of Parks Properties, for example, here's an example of a capital project. So Nelson Playground Southwest Lot Acquisition for Dog Run. So using you know, regex and, and fuzzy string matching with a very conservative threshold, we we'll then map it to the Nelson playground that we find in the parks properties. And then the other data set that we use is the facilities database. So you're like, we have this great data set of public facilities in New York City. So we use that as well. So again, an example, we have Unity Plaza that we have in the facilities database. So that's a pretty easy match. Then map it to Unity Plaza Community Center upgrade as a project. The lucky thing is that with in the capital commitment plan, there is mostly a generally pretty good description of what that project is. So then you manually map some projects because sometimes you can't replace a human. So most of the manual mapping was done back in 2015, 2016, when this first thing was first built. And that was spent a lot of time by me, like listening to a full album and just like geo um, coding stuff. But how do we decide what to map? So to your point of what's not mappable, so we categorize projects. So we have a list of keywords 
And if there's a keyword um, in the description, it then gets assigned a category. So our first category is lump sums. So these will often be funds that will draw be drawn down upon for like other you know, discrete projects. SEA is always a lump sum. Surveys for sewers in the Bronx, that's pretty broad. Then we'll find projects of IT vehicles and equipment. So these aren't things that are fixed to a single place. Yeah, you might be storing servers in a particular building, but those servers can serve a wide area. So we're not too worried about mapping those. We're not even trying to. Fixed assets though. So renovation of Friedman Theater, stormwater on 119th Avenue. These are things that are really impacting your community, whether you see it or not. Like the sewers, you generally don't wanna see them, but they are impacting you. And so this is where we focus our energy when it comes to any manual mapping effort is saying, we're gonna focus our energy on things that have been classified by our algorithm as a fixed asset. We also make sure that we remove faulty geometries. So we've done a pretty comprehensive review of, oh, that's wrong. So we have a list of things to kick out, but all in all, about 40% of projects are mapped. There's a good amount of the capital commitment plan that is not mapped, but about 40% is. So then we also incorporate checkbook and receipt data. Comptroller Lander talked about this morning. I'm really excited to attend to his sessions. The nice thing is that the unique ID that OMB uses is the same ID that's in checkbook and YC. And so we're able to pull data from there. Again, I want to reiterate what Luba said. The capital projects database does not capture all monies allocated to a project. It is like forward looking and some past stuff, which I also highlight again here. So again, like one of the things that I think I look forward to improving as the use cases arise is to have this be more than just a snapshot in time. So right now it is like every single version of the capital projects database is a single capital commitment plan. If a project is no longer in the capital commitment plan, it's no longer reflected in that version. How do we design it to be a little more historical looking? And then again, it's not a project management tool. We, we don't know exactly when shovels are going into the ground for any of these things. And then projects that are more than four years out, things get a little fuzzy. Again, what can you do? So you could explore current and planned capital investments in a neighborhood. You can discover projects that are sponsored by any given agency or understand the overall budget and then use it for support coordination among capital agencies. And then we definitely want to hear from you in the time we have remaining, 10 minutes, nice, of you know, what are your questions and what are the ideas that you have for how you might use these data? Thank you. Oh, sorry. It seems like you always answer my question. Because uh, the, the answer is uh, not everything. Uh, in both sides, other agents, but what is sitting or it seems that like it's uh, covered in other ways. For example, drainage. You don't have the capital, but you have the location. And that area of black and black bumble or where is space corresponds to a new building or a place where uh, on the same thing, the house is replaced by a high rise building. I wouldn't rely, though, on the capital projects database to, to capture all those nuances. Though. No, no, it's, Sorry. yeah. There's a lot of projects especially, like, that are funded because we know, like, we're always doing sewer work, we're always doing sewer, but it's a long cell that just covers a big area to allow those agencies to dynamically spend those funds that they're needed. So there might be projects that we don't, we know they're going to outlive an area, but we're not mapping it because we don't really think that street that it'll be on. There's definitely... Don't apologize. It's a great question. Thank you. Yeah. Is there ability to... Not right now. The way that we published it is we published the latest version. We haven't made all previous versions going back to 20, like 17, say, for example, available. Yeah. But that's... So something drops out. That would be that it's that. Correct. Yeah. But I would love to hear any use cases you have for that. Or just not. Other than your own Oh, I think yeah, I didn't hear that. Did you hear that question? Uh, I think that we have an example coordination that ended up to be for real. If you don't believe this tool. Yeah. Okay. So I can speak to that a little bit. So, yeah, we use the forward book and housing book for coordination of like generating new private ideas or maybe receive or negatively interact with future print product. But one of the main pieces of software is that we as have a, so these are all projects that are approved like, by the office. The budget. A lot of those landings happened before that, like we would want it to. 
So based on this, we have some federal or they give us map projects that aren't yet with pleasure ready. It's a lot of important shit that we're able to build on early for the agents to do both the map actively right we'll get part of the most of in Can you feel like the rock can be actually feeling this part house? Sure. This is in the Capital Projects database, what we define as a unique ID. So it's the agency ID, which is a three-digit code, plus uh, the project ID, which is a combination of unique letters and numbers. And, and this is unique in the Capital Projects database. It's unique in OMB's system for allocating monies to projects. And then it's also the same ID that's used in Checkbook NYC when uh, saying this is the check that's allocated for this project. Yeah. No, we haven't been able to add it. So that's really good feedback of if having even just general information be useful to users, that's definitely a potential enhancement that could be made. Oh, yeah, in the back. <laughs> Yeah, we have an email address. I don't know if it's going to be on the first slide. Okay. Yeah. You say. The prices were going. We have rezoning. We have zoning data, and we have a comprehensive list of addresses. Uh, we could definitely put the two together, or you could put the two together and say where are the addresses that have been rezoned. We don't have it here, though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I keep our question. I know I'm literally find an issue. Please do. Yeah. Is that available? No, not yet. Is that a plan to for the database for if there is enough clamor and, and strong use cases? Yes. <laughs> it's time and energy. Yeah. Okay, I have a question. It's a odd to me that I need that correspond with this very specific description for this big budget item, but then like like Christie Street playground abbreviated. I need to reverse engineer it, fuzzy match it. How is that happening? How is it what I've thought you have being abbreviated? <laughs> Not Christie Street Playground spelled E L A Y versus E L G S D. Yeah. So I guess I'm trying to understand why sure they can reverse engineer it to get E L G match playground, but like how did it get produced? Ah. Uh. Yes. Yeah. No, it's so the way that a lot of this information is inputted is there's the FMS system and OMB. So anyways, there are budget people at each agency that are filling out information in forms online to ask for, to request funding for projects. And so the descriptions that are come here to the best of my understanding are inputted by a person and it's at their discretion for abbreviation. 100%. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what kinds of efforts do your office make the outreach, make the school more accessible? And also, like, how would you see this tool changing to be used by, like, everyday people who are in the looking for location, you know, also looking for, like, general information? Yeah, so we released the tool at the end of summer, frankly, in part, because we wanted to make sure that there was still a little bit of appetite to keep that. So we didn't do outreach at the time because we had such a covered timeline as to make it public. Um, this is something where, again, it's a beta product and we want to do improvements. And I think part of that is outreach. And I think once we make those improvements, we'll have more community outreach that we do around the world. So that is to say that I think we're at the point, the program is to be able to get some sort of community input as we're making a summer. And that outreach will do very soon. If there's, if you're with us as a big group, Brett, and also the community board. Yeah. Does there exist a tool or have you thought about spinning this pilot currently up the way? So this would capture projects underway because usually until a project is done, there's like at least some funding for it. Yes, I, I think there have been a couple of people have asked about past projects because again, this is just a snapshot. So like to, you know, just to do an analysis of a neighborhood, like you're not going to see everything that has been invested in neighborhood. I think there will be a need to start to get some past previous versions of this data set out so you have a historical view. Yeah. I should also mention there's last year, which 
request not just the tenant budget information, but budget management goal. We're going to set about that or by the network. So the status of that I am not totally sure of. We're not we're not reading that, but there is a uh, in the public future will be a, a data product and we actually part of what we're doing what we do that would be enough uh, it's a little water, water, so it's just been, but then there's chat revisions for the adult and stuff. Yeah. Get a question in the back. Yeah. We do have Population Fact Finder, which is a user favorite. There is a definitely the dream to bring all these data sets to like bring population fact finder plus these other data sets together into one there is no plan for that right now yeah uh yes there you go i'll tweet this out too so you can have it oh, okay. yeah what happens the download button at the top right yep what happens it'll download either your filtered view of the data set or the entire data set. And right now, so you can get a CSV format for all or a shape file for the ones that are mapped. The Plus all the other information that we have on that project. Yeah. Thank you so much.